One of the things that I see over and over again is how the lack of dermatology training in medical school really leads to anything presenting on the skin in the hospital as somewhat of a mystery or a conundrum. And so having consultative dermatology is truly a wonderful service that is offered. Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with me, Dr. Raja. And me, Dr. Hadar, where we discuss all things skin. Join us as we delve into the art and science of skin health in today's episode. Hey, Raja, can you say the thing I told you to tell them? Of course. We are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only and is not considered medical advice, nor does it serve as a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Health, Inc. Let's get to the good stuff. Hey, Raja, how are you today? Hey, Hadar. You know, it's a bit rainy. I've been thinking about the coziness of being inside, thinking inpatient, thinking complex. What do you think? Oh, my God. That was a lovely way to introduce our topic for today. You know, in dermatology, we definitely have this kind of reputation that we, you know, every now and then put a cream on someone, maybe a radical dermatologist will give a pill. But when it comes to this doctor, he actually admits his dermatological diseased patients into the hospital. He will go in. He will round on them in the morning, just like we did an internship. Can you remember? Can you think that far? He will put in orders for IV medication, collaborate with other specialists. I mean, my gosh, I think he's a relic of old time, or maybe, maybe he is actually a Renaissance man. Let's talk to him for a minute. Yeah, let's do it. So we have Dr. Scott Elman. He's an assistant professor in the Dr. Philip Frost Department of Dermatology and Cutaneous Surgery at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He's also assistant director of the inpatient dermatology services in that clinic, and he is really focused on complex medical dermatology, rheumatologic dermatology, and as we just mentioned, inpatient medicine. So I have a question for you, Scott. First of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And my first question to you is, you know, they do these things on social media. Tell me you're a dermatologist without telling me you're a dermatologist. Well, one way is we all are like, what does the disinfectant taste like in the hospital? But you actually know. (laughs) That is true. And pro tip is that if you rub that disinfectant under your nose, it actually makes things smell a lot better for some of the smelly things that we admit to the hospital. (laughs) Love Love that. Excellent note. And I think I want to start in the beginning, Scott, because your training is a little unique, even in the dermatology landscape, right? You went to a slightly different residency program, correct? That is true. So I trained in a combined internal medicine dermatology training program, of which there's only a couple in the country. So I was very fortunate to be able to do that. And so what my training looked like was a five-year combined residency with a normal medicine intern year, A second year, though, is entirely dermatology, save for a medicine primary care clinic. And then I bounced back and forth between medicine and dermatology every two months or so until the completion. And the result is being a board-certified internist and dermatologist, which is truly a privilege and an honor. Excellent. So I want to then jump right into it and ask you, inpatient dermatology, most people think about it as consultative service, right? The patient who's admitted for their, I don't know, ulcerative colitis flare, called for a rash and, you know, that kind of stuff. But you actually admit people with dermatological primary disease. Can you tell us what kind of patients come through the doors of the hospital? Absolutely. So I think you make a great point. You know, consultative dermatology is in itself a field that has really blossomed over the past several years. It is a wonderful thing that we're able to help our colleagues in the hospital when rashes arise or skin issues arise. And, you know, one of the things that I see over and over again is just, you know, how the lack of dermatology training in medical school really leads to anything presenting on the skin in the hospital as somewhat of a mystery or a conundrum. And so, Having consultative dermatology is truly a wonderful service that is offered. Now, what I do is slightly different in addition to consultative dermatology, because that is a big piece of what we do. I have the unique opportunity 
to admit patients directly to the hospital under me, you know, run by dermatology residents, and we get to manage, you know, the sickest of the sick with skin disease. And so to answer your question a little bit more straightforward, what do we see? What do we admit? Well, it's not that straightforward. We admit really anyone whose skin disease is bad enough that it warrants them being in the hospital and for whom there's really no other medical issues going on at that time. And so the list is long. I don't mean for this answer to be exhaustive by any means, but I would say that some of the more common things that we admit to the hospital are patients with hydradenitis suppurativa that's flaring, patients with blistering diseases, for example, we've had several patients with pemphigus vulgaris admitted to the hospital recently. We will admit patients for photophoresis for the treatment of their cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. We'll admit erythrodermic patients, patients whose bodies are totally red with rash, either with a known diagnosis and they're coming in for treatment, or really they're coming in for expedited workup. I would say that's just a taste of what we see, but the list is much longer and it keeps us on our toes, to say the least. Scott, I have to say, dermatology unicorn. This is pretty magical stuff, actually. When, <laughs> when we're starting to talk about inpatient medicine, I have to say, just thinking back to residency, you know, we always think like, oh, I got to be on call or this and that. But I always found the inpatients to be very high learning opportunities and also a lot of impact. So my question to you here is, Obviously, you went through your specialized training just for all the listeners. He was at the Harvard Combined Program, which is exceptionally good at giving you both the internal medicine and the dermatology parts of things. You know, you did your training and then afterwards you do your practice. Do you feel like your training prepared you for everything you're going to see or how much learning did you do afterwards as a practitioner that was licensed and working on your own as a faculty member? You know, I think that's a wonderful question, and one that I was actually just talking to a mentee about earlier. You know, so the way that our training works is it was really, even though it's combined training and there were opportunities for combined internal medicine and dermatology through the residency program, we still had to meet both ACGME requirements for both specialties. And so there were a lot of things that at the time I thought were somewhat disparate, you know, rounding on hemonc and ICU or even working in the cardiovascular ICU as part of my medicine training, you know, and then being in dermatology. And, you know, obviously there are aspects of dermatology that are more med derm focused than others, but, you know, we still had to kind of learn everything through training. And so to answer your question, I would say that I didn't train at a place where we admitted our own dermatology patients. We really only served as consultants in the hospital, but what my training did offer and one of the things that I really enjoy about combined med derm training is that you kind of learn different mentalities or different approaches of just answering questions and caring for patients. I would say that dermatology, you know, it's very rapid and quick and you see things and you make a diagnosis and you try things and maybe for the most part, the acuity is somewhat lower. And so you have some opportunities to work through a diagnosis and treatment even by trying in medicine, I think that the way that we approach problems is somewhat different. I think that everyone is thoughtful, but, you know, internists tend to be very thoughtful, as we all may remember from how long rounds can go in the morning. Yeah, my rounds are still going from third year med school. We're <laughs> about to wrap up soon. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but I no, but what I was saying is that, you know, I think the training of medicine just prepares you in a, in a different way. You know, you deal with a, overall a higher complexity. Truly in the moment, there's life and death decisions. And so it just prepares you in a different way. And so to answer Roger's question, when I started working admitting my own patients, I really view myself as a dermatology hospitalist. You know, I bring the training from internal medicine and caring for patients with heart failure or even mystery diagnoses uh, and bringing that to dermatology. And so while no, I have not seen everything or I did not see everything in training that I currently do, I feel more well equipped having done both trainings to be able to know what resources to seek, to kind of know what to try and to know when to ask for help, for example. And honestly, I think that this is true for MedDerm, but for really any trainee who's transitioning to being an attending, I don't know that any residency of anything prepares you to see everything that you're going to see. 
but I think that you have to know that you're equipped with the tools to look things up, to ask for help, et cetera. So a lot of the people who I've worked with, who residents who are older than me who graduated said that they viewed their first couple of years of being an attending as almost doing a pseudo fellowship. You know, you're still learning on the job. And I would have to argue that maybe it's not even a couple of years, it's the whole practice of medicine. I mean, that's ultimately what, what life is. So long-winded answer to say that, you know, even though I do something unique, I think that the combined training in medicine really does prepare one to do this. And it doesn't have to be a full medicine residency. I would say that if anyone is interested in inpatient dermatology or even consultative dermatology, doing a rigorous internal medicine prelim year probably still gets you some of the way there in terms of the training or the mindset that's required to care for these patients. Yeah, you know, I think one point that you mentioned here that really resonates with me, and I think Hadar, you'll probably agree as well, and I think, Scott, you already just mentioned it, is that no matter what you do, I mean, whether you are a dermatologist, whether you are, I mean, we know this is true now in the field, there are nurse practitioners, physician assistants, or if you're a naturopathic doctor, or anyone like primary care you're going into the field. I mean, the residency and training is only going to get you so far, but I so resonate with what you said, Scott, because, you know, in my first year of practice, now you actually had to see the follow-ups. You actually had to like follow them over time. And like these patients were yours. And, and I feel like there's a lot of learning that happens that no one can teach you. Like there is this art to medicine that people can give you insight in, but you don't really learn until you sit in the so-called medical cockpit. And then now you got to maneuver out there between the clouds and no one can teach you what the steering wheel feels like until you feel it, you know? And I feel like that aspect of medicine is something that maybe trainees or people that are just graduating maybe don't appreciate till you get there. And then you see like, hey, man, that textbook didn't have all the answers. It just gave me some of the starting points and the clues to, to then figure it out. I think that's a fantastic analogy. That's wonderful. And Raja, you alluded to that effect it had on you in your training. And I also cherished my time in the inpatient setting. One of the things I loved as a doctor is to have that ability to see the skin changes with the therapy in a more short period of time, right? So in the outpatient setting, we'll give a patient a cream, maybe see them in six, eight weeks. Here you do treatment and then you come examine the skin 24 hours later. And you see that every 24 hours for the number of days the patients are in. And so I thought that was a wonderful thing for the clinician. I hope you would agree, Scott. I think we talked about what how it's good for the doctors and how unique it is. What is the advantage for the patients compared to outpatient therapy, Scott? I think bringing it back to patient-centered is such a key piece of this. You know, I would never disparage on consultative dermatology or other services within the hospital that primarily manage skin disease. I truly think that being the dermatologist who's caring for those who are admitted with a primary dermatologic issue we are truly the experts in the skin. I think it is us, it is our specialty to care for these patients, to know the intricacies of what it means to manage a certain diagnosis. And so while I agree and I acknowledge that our position at the University of Miami is somewhat of a unicorn, you know, it's somewhat mythical, we do exist, so maybe a unicorn is not the right analogy there, but I think my point is... <laughs> Oh, no, no. I, th I think unicorn is good. Like there's very few dermatologists. I, I, I really admire what you do, Scott, because I think you have a front row seat on complex stuff that honestly dermatologists should be doing. For sure. so, and I think that's exactly it. I think that dermatologists within the house of medicine, you know, as, as we mentioned before, dermatology is not just prescribing creams or making things dry that are wet and vice versa, as lots of my colleagues like to tell me that that's what my job is. <laughs> that's nephrology, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we know the spectrum of how severe disease can be. We know how debilitating some of these primary dermatologic issues can be. And so I think that we are well poised and well suited to be able to care for each aspect, both in the acute care setting, as well as knowing what follow up to suggest, knowing how to follow these patients and knowing what to look for. And also knowing what to look for if things aren't going well and to be able to see these patients on a day to day basis in the hospital and know when to pivot or try something else if your first line, second line, third line treatment isn't working. Uh, you know, historically, inpatient dermatology did exist more, uh, and it's really kind of fallen by the wayside over the years for numerous reasons that, you know, only some of which I probably understand. But I do think that there is room for 
dermatologists to continue or to resume caring for the sickest of the sick who are hospitalized. Because again, I think it's within our wheelhouse to do so. And the other piece of this is that I, with ongoing time, the critical mass of physicians like myself who are trained in internal medicine and dermatology is increasing. And so I do think that there is a potential role of expanding certain services outside of the walls of, in Miami, again, knowing that, or at least believing personally, that what we are able to do for patients is, you know, dare I say, superior to other care that patients may receive in the hospital. That is very true. You know, I think one of the things that come to mind to me is the concept of of integrative medicine, right? And integrative medicine is a spectrum. And we always think, okay, in integrative dermatology, we do a lot of stuff that's on the other side of severity. But some of these patients, man, they are doing really, really bad. And we should always include in our integrative thinking the idea that maybe this patient really needs acute care right now. And it doesn't matter what you think about conventional medicine, if you will, or allopathic medicine. From wherever you are, I think all of us agree that when the time comes, if you have really, really bad skin disease, you want the skin experts there. You don't want a dermatologist when you have a heart attack. So you don't want a cardiologist when you have pemphigus vulgaris covering 80% of your body. I think you really, really want a dermatologist that understand what's going on. And that's great. I wanted to ask you about something you just mentioned about this growing body of experts that are coming into the market of healthcare, if you will, that are trained like you, because I think it's an interesting pattern, right? Dermatology went to an outpatient practice completely, uh, virtually all the training was like that. And then there was a yearn, there was some need to develop these med derm programs to fill this kind of void that opened up with this need that you are actually filling right now. And I'm wondering, why do you think that happened? So why first did outpatient dermatology took over and inpatient dermatology disappear? Do you think it was uh, basically an issue of cost with managed care kind of coming through the turn of the century and basically saying, all right, if it costs that much, out of here. A lot of patients were admitted with psoriasis. We have biologics that help to manage most of the severe cases. Or do you think it was a comfort issue or it was the cost of training? Said, hey, why do we need to do dermatology as a fellowship? Just shorten down, do residency. Any insights on what is your theory and how things became the way they are? Some theory, some speculation, but some history that I actually am familiar with. So the creation of the combined medicine dermatology residency really dates back to some critical thought leaders within dermatology, including Dr. Victoria Wirth and Dr. Richard Sontheimer. Both of these, I think, viewed dermatology as heading, quote unquote, in the wrong direction. This was in the late 90s, if I'm not mistaken. They viewed that we were moving away from you know, being medical doctors and focusing more on cosmetic and surgery and really losing the ownership of these diseases that had been very much square in the house of dermatology for a long time. And so, again, not discrediting those who are cosmetic dermatologists and surgical dermatologists, there's quite a need to care for our patients in those aspects. But really, it was the fear that if we were not going to be the specialists caring for these diseases, if patients were admitted to the hospital or if patients came to our clinic, then we were going to lose them as a specialty and other specialties might absorb them. So the fear that internal medicine would become the experts in time to guess, et cetera. So with that fear that they were losing the ability to care for the sickest of the sick is really what prompted individuals to create the combined training in internal medicine and dermatology. And so it keeps growing and growing based on, you know, every year we graduate more people with similar training. And I'm always made happy. Anytime I talk to a young budding dermatologist who says to me, you know what, Dr. Elman, I'm interested in what you do and I want to be just like you, because that shows me that there's hope and there's interest and I think that this field is only going to grow. And so it's good that we publicize what we do because not everyone's familiar with the combination of medicine dermatology training or even that there's the opportunity to care for sick hospitalized dermatology patients as dermatologists. So that's number one. Now, why did inpatient dermatology really fall by the wayside, the true admitting patients to the hospital? I can't speak to this as well as, let's say, my chairman, Dr. Robert Kersner, who is the person who led the service before I joined. 
but my understanding is that it's a couple of folds. One is declining reimbursements as entities in the hospital were ultimately paid for by DRGs. And then the second piece, as you alluded to, Hadar, is that we just got good at treating some of the things that patients were hospitalized for. We got good and, you know, there have been wonderful medicines that have come out. So, you know, patients are rarely, more so than in the past, rarely erythrodermic with psoriasis. We can start patients on, you know, wonderful biologics. You know, and the same thing with Pemphigus vulgaris, for example, if it's caught and treated early, you know, rituximab's truly been a game changer. So I think that we are switching our focus ultimately in terms of what we're seeing in the inpatient. My understanding is that historically we did admit a lot of patients for Geckerman therapy for erythrodermic psoriasis. I would say that that is pretty rare at this point, and we are, you know, admitting patients for... Yeah, probably UCSF, huh? I think they're the only ones that do that, the Geckerman therapy now, at least that I'm aware of. UCSF does it. I think Mayo may still do it occasionally. And I will say that we have a couple of patients for whom we still treat it. But again, that used to be the bread and butter. And now that's become the rarity for what we do. I think the other piece that I haven't said yet is, you know, there's also just some benefits of admitting patients too, you know, so maybe it's got, it was more popular. It got less popular. Now it's getting popular again. But the coordination of care that we can deliver in the inpatient is just leaps and bounds more than we're able to do as an outpatient and even just easier. So again, I think all told, it's just lots of benefits for the patient to care for them holistically. So Scott, I want to bring this home with maybe an example, okay, a theoretical example, because I think a lot of the clinicians out there can wrap their head around the clinical example. So let's take me because, gosh, every now and then, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen that patient comes to my clinic with really bad hydroadenitis suppurativa. I'm talking about patients that have been bounced around, different doctors, got endless amounts of antibiotics, have gotten loads of prednisone, maybe even started on adalimumab at some point and failed or just couldn't get all the coordination of the, you know, the specialty pharmacy and they moved and they come to me. And I've had a few patients like this that come in and they can't walk. They have so much pain. I ask them, how much is it from zero to 10? They say 25. You examine them. They are oozing from every skin fold. They are in pain. It's malodorous. And, you know, they tell me, doc, I, I don't know how I'm going to get to work tomorrow. And to me, often that could be an indication to consider inpatient admission. Let's take this case. How about that? So, when I send these patients to you, Scott, give us kind of a sense of what do you do with these patients? What do they get? And then maybe how is the handoff working for me? And I can give a, an example as well, what I do when I kind of hear back from you. I think that while this seems theoretical and or hypothetical, again, this is a very common thing that we do care for in the inpatient setting. And I think I highlight if someone's ever on the verge of deciding whether or not they need to admit someone, I would truly say that the functional impairment that patients are experiencing, you know, is the severity marker that I think can really help say this patient's not doing well, they need to be admitted. So I really do approach treating the patient with hydradenitis in the hospital in a multidisciplinary and multifactorial way. So in no particular order, if this patient's coming into the hospital, I'm admitting them to my service because you've seen them, you're an expert and you say they need to, you know, they need to be seen. Again, I'm already taking that, you know, that seriously and I'm saying, okay, this person needs to be here. First things first, I assess the patient. I, you know, will tend to agree with your exam. We focus on getting their pain under control. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I was like, you said pain under control. Yeah, sorry. so pain under control, you know, that's usually the thing that patients are complaining about the most when they're acutely coming in, more so, I would say, than the drainage that they're experiencing. So, But we'll focus on treating their pain. We'll focus on inpatient wound care to be able to assess the wound needs that exist in the moment. For a disease like hydradenitis that does require, you know, multidisciplinary care, depending on the extent of the disease and what's existed already, we might consider obtaining imaging to see if there's any deep abscesses that need to be drained, any signs of osteomyelitis for something really deep. We're talking to consultant physicians. Often we're getting the surgeons to weigh in and whether or not there's anything that's, you know, potentially surgically managed within these patients. And then we focus on medical treatment. You know, in the acute setting for a really draining wound, I do think that there may be a role for, you know, 
anti-inflammatory medicines like steroids. And then often we're starting patients on medications like IV antibiotics, specifically vertepenem, which has some great data to support it. And not only are we starting that medicine in the hospital, but patients are you know, receiving the advanced access that they will need to be able to maintain therapy for six weeks. We work on coordinating getting home health set up for these patients. We work on getting even just the antibiotics set up for these patients for a six week duration as an example. The other piece that we do in the hospital is try to tee these patients up for ultimately starting them on what might be a better control or medication for them. So if we think about starting TNF medications, we're often you know, screening them for their hepatitis, for their tuberculosis, to make sure that there's nothing you know, that we are missing before initiating a medicine. I will say that you know, these patients are very satisfying to take care of in the hospital because they are very rare that I would say that you know, most patients who are sent in you know, come in not walking or really in bad shape. And I would say three days, five days, a relatively short stay is enough time for these patients to really turn the corner, to regain their functionality. And at the same time, we are setting them up for success now I'm sending them back to you to, you know, to kind of continue on the journey of what will hopefully be a control of their disease with stronger medication. So I hope that gives you a sense of everything that we're doing in tandem. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to those of you out there who work in centers where you get these patients who are terribly ill, I cannot tell you how much of a blessing it is to have something like Dr. Elman in the inpatient unit because it is my secret power tool for patients who are just falling apart. I mean, I always think about it as, you know, you have this 1980 Ford Escort who's falling apart. You know, one wheel is wheeling off. You know, the the engine is steaming. You have like fire coming out of the backside and everything is falling apart. And you're kind of saying, okay, I'll take a screwdriver, put the wheel on everything while driving. Then we're going to go to the other side and fix the engine. Everything is falling apart at the same time. And the only way to really take care of it is stop get into a garage and fix it. And that's how I do this. And in one not very dissimilar example, we had a patient like this I just saw the other day. And he came in and this guy has his own business. He was really pushing through life and really disregarding the disease. And I felt that it was really a disservice to him to not admit him. I said, listen, you got to take care of yourself. You're about to collapse, literally. And he looked at his wife. He said, you know, maybe we just got to do this. And we admitted him. And everything that Scott just described happened. He already kind of bounced back. I was able to bridge him into a TNF therapy right away. And I, we saw him, what, I think six or eight weeks later, the guy who was crawling into my office ran in and I saw him actually in follow-up. The second follow-up, three months later, he said, Doc, I got to go. I got a basketball game going. And just saying this, give me, you know, a little bit of goosebumps, but that's the effect you can do on patients right there with an inpatient service that really supports you for those really, really bad cases. So with that optimistic example, we'll sign off. Thank you, Dr. Elman, for joining us, for introducing us to the inpatient dermatology unit, something that may be coming to a hospital near you. And if not, be on the lookout because it is an important addition to our holistic care for our patients. Thank you so much. Thank you. The pleasure and the honor is all mine. I'm so happy to give a stage to something that I think is so important and for something that I hope to see more of over the course of my career. Thanks again. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode with Dr. Raja and Dr. Hadar. This podcast is brought to you by Learn Skin, leaders in integrative dermatology education. Visit learnskin.com forward slash podcast to explore our many programs or subscribe to the podcast today and never miss an episode. Hey, have a great day and stay curious.